Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 7th of April and a pretty quick update this week. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week, I created a video looking into guest management for Azure AD. Nearly every organization has guests, but how do we manage them? What's the right way to onboard them, maintain them, eventually remove them from our tenant? So I went through all the different lifecycle elements and the technologies that can help us with that. And then I created a video just about if I'm using GitHub and I'm doing deployments into various cloud services, but I used Azure as an example, what's the best way today available for that authentication? How do I authenticate my workflow to, for example, Azure without having to have some secret stored in my GitHub repository. So I walk through how we can use OpenID Connect for that authentication. Then on to what's new. So on the compute side, the DLSV5 and the DLDSV5, remember the small d means it has temporary storage. We now get the choice, do we want that temporary storage there or not? Well, these general purpose VMs have now gone GA. Now the term general purpose is interesting for these. Normally general purpose, there's a ratio between the virtual CPU and the Gibby bytes of memory. It's typically one to four. What's special about these is it's a low, the L, amount of memory. So it's now a ratio of one virtual CPU to two Gibby bytes of memory. I think it's still considered general purpose because of the types of processor, it's not a specialized processor, but the big deal about these is it is a lower amount of memory. So if I don't need as much memory, if I do have maybe more CPU centric, now I can use these DL series virtual machines for that. They go all the way up to 96 virtual CPUs, which would be 192 Gibby bytes of memory, and obviously there's all the sizes in between. Then for Azure Automation, when I create a new runbook, I now will have the option of using PowerShell 7.2 or Python 3.10 in preview. Just, hey, I can take advantage of those new uh, versions. And then for Azure Backup, if I'm using UltraDisk, I will now have the ability to include that data disk as part of my backup. Remember, UltraDisk gives me the lowest possible latency. The IOPS and the throughput are independently configured and dynamically changeable. So while the disk is in use, I can change those dials for IOPS and throughput and obviously pay for the amount of IOPS and throughput I have at any given moment in time. Well, now if I'm using an enhanced policy for Azure Backup, I can include those ultra disks. Now this is in preview, it's only certain regions today, but we can see that's coming. On the networking side, so this is an interesting one. So if I'm using an App Gateway v2 SKU, I now have this private option available in preview. So App Gateway, up till this, has always had a public address. I could have a private as well, but it had to have a public. What this lets me do is no longer have that public address required. I just have a private address. Now that interest adds a few interesting things. If I think about what I had to have in the past for network security groups, I, I had to have a, a certain amount of outbound. I couldn't deny all outbound. I had to allow communication inbound from the gateway manager. Well, that's not required anymore. For my user defined routes, I could not have an all zero next hop to a virtual appliance. I could not have false tunneling, i.e. an all zeros advertised via BGP from something. Well, now I can. So with this private app gateway, I get more flexibility on the NSGs and the user-defined routes. And of course, I don't have to have that public IP address. And then there were a few retirements. I didn't include them all, but express route public peering, that's retiring, going away, end of March, 2024. I don't think you've been able to create this for about five years now. You should use Microsoft peering instead. It's got enhanced routing options. It's a better option, but just no public peering is going bye-bye. On the database side, so PostgreSQL single server is retiring uh, 28th of March, 2025. Single server, 
doesn't support any of the newer versions of Postgres. It's got none of the flexibility of configurations or the functionality of the new flexible model. I talked about, I think last week, there's now better migration available from single to flexible. So basically get off single, get to flexible. Speaking of which, Postgres SQL Flexible now has read replicas as gone generally available. So I can have up to five of these. It is asynchronous, but in most cases, it's near real time. Now, if I have a very, very write intensive workload hitting the primary, then sure, there may be an increased latency of the uh, transactions hitting those replicas. But for most things, it's gonna be pretty close to real time. But obviously I have to be able to tolerate that latency. This is going to be really useful if I have some read intensive workloads and I don't want that to have an impact on the primary. I can offload those to one of these read replicas. Those read replicas can be promoted to read write, for example, for disaster recovery purposes. And those five can be in really any regions we want. It is using the native Postgres SQL replication, which helps give me this really good performance. And then miscellaneous, so Azure Site Recovery, we always think of ASR these days as Azure to Azure, but it started out life as on-premises, uh, VMware replicating to Azure or another VMware, Hyper-V to Azure, etc. So they're still working on those technologies. So now if I have Hyper-V with large disks, those can now be supported with Azure Site Recovery. Now, that replication to Azure has to be to a managed disk, not unmanaged. And now it's gonna support data disks up to 32 terabytes. For the OS, it can be up to four terabytes if it's a Gen 2, or two terabytes if it's a Gen 1. So OS disk is obviously smaller, four terabytes Gen 2, two terabytes Gen 1, but the data disk can be up to 32 terabytes. Again, it has to be to a managed disk. There is a new version of the replication provider I have to be running on the Hyper-V host. So just make sure you're running the newest version. And also they announced for Azure Monitor, um, custom fields are being retired. Now what this means is I need to move to data collection rules. As part of data collection rules, I can use KQL for transformations on the attributes coming in and populate into um, the, my own values I want. So I can still achieve the same thing, but the mechanism is moving from this custom field concept to instead use data collection rules and its KQL transformations. But I have until end of March, 2026, so yeah, quite a long time. And that was it. I said it was a quick update this week. I hope that was useful. Uh, until next video, take care.